David, you can't be a priest, uh, uh, that that lineage comes from Levi. So if you look back in the Old Testament, one of the things that is interesting is there is one Old Testament priest who is also a king, and that is Melchizedek. And so we're going to talk about him a little bit this morning, the priesthood of Melchizedek and how that uh, affects our understanding of Messiah. And uh, so we're going to take a look there and meet him in Genesis chapter 14 and get a full picture of who he was, what he had to do with Messiah, and how his history helped to shape the expectation among the Jews for the coming of Messiah. So let's go there this morning. Genesis chapter 14, beginning in verse 17. Open up your, your app or your Bible, either way. Scroll down there to verse 17. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. Please follow along in whatever translation you have in your lap. That's my favorite one. Let's take a look. Genesis chapter 14, 17, and we read, And after this, after his return from the defeat of Cheldelamar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh. And that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, for he was priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Blessed be the reading of God's holy word. All right, so a couple of things we see in this passage right off the bat is I want you to notice that Abram, he's not Abraham yet, he's just Abram, right? So we know that uh, some things have not yet been pronounced over him. This is very early uh, in his uh, uh, being revealed to us as Abraham, the father of faith. He's just simply known as Abram at this time. He has gone from the land of the Ur of the Chaldees uh, to the land of Canaan uh, and being promised what is going to come to him. And yet uh, he hasn't received those promises yet. He's just simply come into the land and he is a stranger there in the land. Now, Melchizedek, we know that he is a priest and a king. We know that he is Abram's neighbor, using that term very broadly, very broadly. Very broadly, okay? He lives in the same general area as, as uh, Abram does, uh, along with other kings. We have the king of Sodom is involved in this time, the kings of Gomorrah. And so understand simply this, that when we're talking about, we're talking about city-states, right? We're talking about, in that day, uh, the idea of a large nation was virtually unheard of. Uh, you start to see that develop, the idea of larger nations uh, as we go through the Bible. But very early on, typically a city was a nation. They were independent all of themselves. That's why they built walls and fortified their cities. And a king was basically something more akin to what we would think of today as kind of a warlord or something like that governing a small area. So here we have these kings, and, and he is the king of Salem. Now, I can tell you a couple of things about him, just simply from that little passage that we look at. Uh, first is that his title, King of Salem, and being priest of God, is loaded with imagery. The word Salem means peace. And so there's just that simple sense that you could look at his title and understand, in essence, he is the King of Peace, which is kind of interesting when you think about Messiah in terms of uh, like the prophecy that's probably best known uh, in our society, in our culture, because of songs that we sing at Christmas time, Isaiah 9, 6, one of the images of Messiah is Prince of Peace, right there with wonderful counselor, mighty God, uh, everlasting Father. Uh, we see that, that whole uh, kind of imagery uh, born out there, but he is Prince of Peace, and isn't it kind of interesting here that we have the King of Peace and that we're tying these two things together. Now, it doesn't go into a whole lot there, doesn't elaborate on that, but it could just be even maybe a uh, coincidence, but I think it's probably a little more than that. Let's take a look here. But most importantly, let me point out this, that Melchizedek is, his priestly order is pre the law. In other words, uh, there is no law at this point. Remember, Abram uh, is going to give uh, birth to a son, Isaac, right? Uh, the 
because uh, his wife will laugh that she's going to have a baby in her old age. And, and, and we're talking about generations out before we will get uh, to, uh, um, to uh, Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, uh, to Moses uh, being a part of that lineage and so forth. So we're way before, at this point, listen, none of the Bible has been written. None. The book Genesis that we're reading that from, remember, was penned by Moses, who is generations yet to come. So the reality is, is that, is that, there, that at this point in time is that there is no law and there is simply this priest, Melchizedek, whose order is older than the law, older than the order of Levi, older than the Bible. That's the case here. So that means, of course, that there was no Aaron and there was no Moses. So the priesthood of Melchizedek is very different than the Aaronic priesthood in the law of Moses. Since Melchizedek was Abraham's priest, and Abraham was the father of faith, Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything he had. Now, there's something really significant in that, uh, because... Uh, it, here, here's the thing, and we'll look at this more when we get to the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 7, but there's this picture of uh, the idea that Melchizedek is greater than Moses. He's paying tithes to him, he's giving gifts to him, he's honoring him with a tenth of everything he has. There's this sense of expectation that blessing flows from the greater to the lesser, and he is the one who is doing the blessing of Abraham. Now, there is... A little side point here, just thought I'd mention this to you, is that, can I just point out that as he gives him a tenth of all that he has, that tithing isn't about keeping the law. Hello? Tithing is not about the law of Moses. Tithing was before the Bible. It was before the law of Moses. So you can't put tithing on the law. You can't say, well, we're not under the law. I don't do that anymore. Uh, because the example of giving... Old Testament and New Testament, no exceptions, is that there is no gift that is pleasing to God that is less than a tithe. Hello? There is not a single example, Old Testament or New Testament. In fact, in the New Testament, usually when people are commended for giving, it's because they gave all that they had. That's a lot more than 10%. That's 100%. Just helping you if you're a little rusty on your math there. I know it's been a few years uh, you know, since you had an algebra class. That, that, you know that class that you thought... What is this any good for? My wife will explain that to you. Okay, anyhow. Uh, 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 nonetheless, uh, uh, the point is, is that this idea of tithing is, is really is not connected to the law. But more importantly, and our primary issue here today, is that Abraham, the father of faith, gave Melchizedek, the priest of God, his tithe as an act of faithfulness and worship. Now, I want you to keep that in mind, kind of just if you will, just hold on to that thought because we're going to like gather a few facts along the way for when we get to the New Testament because here's the thing is that uh, it's easy to just go run to the New Testament and like grab these things uh, all together in a single passage and it's really neat and everything. But what I want to drive home to you is that all of this is rooted in the Old Testament. In other words, that your and I understanding of what, it, what Christmas is about, what Advent is all about, of who Jesus is as the Messiah, all comes to us from the Old Testament. It's not something we just simply pull out of the hat. Magically, in the New Testament, it's not like God was, you know, a, a meanie in the Old Testament and became a Christian in the New Testament. You know, none of that kind of stuff washes. The Bible is very united. So here we have uh, Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God, and Abraham, the father of faith, is worshiping God and giving his tithe as an act of faithfulness and worship to Melchizedek. Now, then we go to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Now, you probably have read Psalm 110 a number of times, didn't even realize it if you've never actually just turned to Psalm 110, because Psalm 110 appears over and over again throughout the New Testament. It is probably one of the most quoted psalms when we're talking about Messiah. Psalm 110, uh, beginning in verse 1, we read it this way. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. 
The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You, here we go, are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Or Melchizedek, or how, you know, depending on which school you come from. Anyhow, and the Lord is at your right hand, and he will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment over the nations, filling them with corpses. But he will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. Now, like I said, that psalm is very well known as a messianic psalm, and it's quoted multiple times in the New Testament as in reference to Jesus as Messiah. Most famously, you and I uh, just recently went through the book of Acts, right? And, and there in Acts chapter 2, uh, on the very first day in which they are proclaiming Jesus as Messiah, in which the church is established and Peter is established, and he's preaching the Word of God that day, he quotes right here from Psalm 110. The Apostle Peter asked the question, how is it that David can say the, to the Lord, as in Yahweh, my Lord, sit at my right hand? He says, this whole picture that he's creating, he says, there's a problem here if you think that David is talking about himself. One of the primary points that Messiah is both the son of David, and David's Lord, meaning that he is greater than the patriarch King David, is this psalm right here where he's quoting, and it says, the Lord sit at my Lord's right hand. There's this reference, and, and he asks the question, he says, you know, isn't David's uh, uh, tomb with us still here today? How can he say, the Lord sit at my Lord's right hand and rule over the nations and do these things? How could that possibly be? And he's making the point here, that's because that the Heir of David, the Messiah, is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's even King of King David. Now, this psalm is also quoted over in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke. It's also quoted in Ephesians. It's quoted, quoted in Corinthians. And it's quoted numerous times in Hebrews, which, of course, we're going to talk about a bit today. But every time that this psalm is quoted, uh, it's going to be quoted specifically in reference to Jesus as Messiah. Very important here. So we go back to Psalm 110, verse 4, and we read that part. Messiah is not only King of kings and Lord of lords, but he is priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So by necessity of kingly lineage, the Messiah cannot be a Levitical priest, cannot be under the Old Testament law. Therefore, he must be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And so the, the psalmist tells us, look, listen, he's going to be king of kings. He's even David's king. He's Lord of lords. He's, he reigns over all, over all the earth, and all the earth will be judged by him. And he is priest of God Most High in the order of Melchizedek, which is not based on law and not based on lineage. So then what qualifies him then to be priest of most high God. Well, you could simply say, well, uh, duh, God said so. So that's like the end of it, right? Okay. And you're right. You're right. I mean, but sometimes that kind of, you know, point when we just say things like that, you know, well, the Bible says that I believe it, therefore that's the end of it. Uh, when you're talking to someone doesn't really hold a lot of weight. But there is some great truth to that. Specifically, when we're talking about the high priest who is able to make sacrifice on behalf of the people of God as a nation. Not just simply making sacrifice for the individual, but also for the collective sin of the people. Also for those in positions of high authority, both kings and priests. To answer that, let's take a look then at the New Testament epistle of Hebrews. First, we, we have Hebrews 5. I'm not going to take the time to read Hebrews 5 right in this moment because I'm going to read to you from Hebrews chapter 7, and I don't want to you know, like keep you here all the way to lunch. I wouldn't mind you would. Um, but uh, Hebrews chapter 5, 
uh, that first 10 verses there, uh, does a lot to summarize what I've just been telling you about. The chapter tells us that no one can take on the honor of priest, that nobody has that right, but that God must appoint them. So there, there is your point. It, it's because God said so, right? But the point being is that God appoints them to be a priest just as God appointed the line of Levi, and before Levi, God appointed Melchizedek. Then after Levi, God appoints Jesus according to that old order of Melchizedek. Now, if you look over that, if you'll go back and take some time to read Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10 on your own, one of the things that you'll realize as you look at the peculiarity of the wording is that it's citing, in particular, it's referencing, it's quoting Psalm 110, verse 4. And it goes and it builds its argument there in Hebrews chapter 5 based on the understanding uh, of Psalm 110, verse 4. It's, it's the whole idea of being there is that the only way that he can be the priest, the only way he can be priest is because of this passage back here that the psalmist uses. Now, what we see there then is that this, this whole witness of Scripture across both Old and New Testament coming together to form our understanding of the Messiah as priest of God. Now, holding all of those pieces I've given you so far, that he is in the order of Melchizedek, that he is king of kings, and the only way that he can be uh, the king in the uh, messianic line of David is that he must be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. He can't be a Levitical priest, and that's how he can occupy both of those offices at the same time, the same way Melchizedek did, holding on to that piece there in Hebrews chapter 5, that how it explains that one must be appointed priest of God, not take that on to themselves. We go to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to start there in verse 11. <clears throat> but as you're scrolling there to verse 11, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11, I was going to point out that the first 10 verses there basically tell you everything concisely what I just showed you from all those other places in the Old Testament. It doesn't say, go back to Genesis chapter 14, go to Psalm 110. He just simply quotes it as if you're supposed to already know those things because the expectation of the Hebrew writer is that by the time that you're getting to the letter of Hebrews that you're mature and you already know the Old Testament. Hello? Right? Because Hebrews chapter 6, just before it says that you shouldn't be living on milk, that you should be in the meat of the Word, and you should know these things, but we'll just assume you do. Okay, and so we get here uh, to Hebrews chapter 7 in those first few verses, and he's telling us these things, and he writes, and he says that since Abraham was the grandfather of those 12 tribes, and he paid his tithes to Melchizedek, it was as if Levi was paying tithes to Melchizedek meaning that it's a higher priesthood, that the priests of God in the Old Testament, uh, the, the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, did not pay tithes, remember? They received the tithes, and that's what they lived out of. Uh, that was how they made their way. But there is an exception. They paid tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek because it was a greater priesthood. Now, if Levi was paying tithes to Melchizedek, it also says Abraham sought the blessing of Melchizedek, that making him greater, which is what we were hinting at there in Genesis 14. And then we come to chapter 7 of Hebrews, verse 11, and we read this. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? So he's, making a, he's driving home a really important point here, right? I mean, that, that the law was not able to save and that the law in, inherently had weaknesses that needed to be addressed. What further need would there be for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. This is where you and I understand that you and I are not under the law. 
For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. There's no one from the tribe of David. There's no one from the house of Judah that has served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. God doesn't just change things arbitrarily. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of the undestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. There's a sense here also that he's, he's telling us something, that there's something unique and special about the lineage or about the uh, order of Melchizedek, that Melchizedek is likewise not a priest on the basis of lineage, but he also is a priest forever. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God, by which you and I are able to enter into His presence, by which you and I, if you take a look, we don't have time to do it right now, but you can scroll over to Hebrews chapter 10, and it talks about the whole idea of you and I drawing near to the very presence of God through the veil that is Christ's flesh, that that's the only reason that you and I are able to enter into His presence, but because of that veil that is His flesh, because of that, you and I are able to go into the very throne room of God. You and I, though we are not the high priest of God, you and I have access. Yes, hello, somebody's clapping back there. Um, Um, uh, that you and I have access to him because of that. And it is not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made with such without an oath, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor or the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He stands in the gap between you and I and the Father. He stands in the gap. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Do you catch that? See, every other priest was sinful, and therefore his intercession was limited by his own need for atonement. He could not stand in the gap until he first took care of his own issues. But when Jesus offered his sacrifice, it was perfect because he was perfect. So just as his priesthood was forever, so his sacrifice was also forever. Then chapter 8 goes on to tell us about how Jesus then sat down at the right hand of the Father, making perfect forever those who worship Him. But that key sentence for you and me right now is right there in verse 22. Because He is the guarantor of a better covenant. You see, Messiah isn't just a priest. I always hate that saying, just a priest, you know, as if there was just something like a priest. But he is the priest to end all priests. 
He's the final priest. You and I, then being priest, royal priesthood, you see, our role is just to imitate what he does, but there's nothing new. There's no new forgiveness of sins. Uh, there, there's only one forgiveness of sins. There's no more need for the forgiveness. There is one sacrifice that was been made that was made by Messiah. So you and I, as priests of Most High God, the way we intercede for people is through prayer. The way we intercede to people is we bring them to the Messiah, that final seal of the priests. But we don't make a sacrifice for sin. See, that's the reason that you and I probably need to rethink our eschatology because when it comes to the temple and the, the idea of reestablishing the Levitical priesthood, that doesn't fit with what's just read right there. The Messiah doesn't need a Levitical priesthood. The Levitical priesthood was replaced. It wasn't just set aside for a moment. It wasn't just on vacation for a, a couple of thousand years. It says that they are done because... He is the eternal priest forever, and that's why your sins are forgiven forever. You don't ever need anyone else to ever offer another sacrifice for you. We don't need another priesthood. We don't need another temple because He is the living temple forever and ever and ever. Amen. And that one's for free because we're not talking about eschatology today, but but yes, we are. You see, Jesus as Messiah, last week I, I pointed out, he's the great seal of the prophets. So there's no more further need of revelation in the sense of Scripture. There's no more need for revealing of his plan because that's the plan. There's not a plan B. There's not a plan C. There's no other plan. The only plan throughout all of eternity is his plan. And everyone who prophesies has to be in agreement with what he says. It has to agree with the word of God. And if they say something different, they're a false prophet. They're a lying prophet. There's only one prophecy. There's no other great seal of the prophets. Abraham, you know, from, from the lineage of Abraham, there's no one else coming. He's it. The great seal. He seals the prophets. And Messiah is the great seal of the priests. There's no more priests. There's no one else like him. There's no other sacrifice that has to be made. In fact, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 says, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. That's because there's no more need if you accept Jesus Christ. And if you don't, he says, then there remains nothing but the terrifying expectation of judgment. He is the last priest. There is no other sacrifice for sins. There is no other hope. He's the great seal of the prophets. He's the great seal of the priests. He is the last and the greatest prophet. He's the last and the greatest priest. And next week we will see Messiah. He's the last and greatest king. He is king of kings and Lord of lords, meaning there will never be another one after him. When he comes in glory to present his kingdom to his father, that is the end. Last and greatest, last and greatest, last and greatest, that's what makes him the Messiah and nothing less. And that, church, that is actually what Advent is all about. That the last and greatest has come, and we wait in expectation from his first coming for his second coming, and we say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. Let's stand together, shall we? You know, it is important that you and I get our heads and our hearts around this idea of who Jesus is as Messiah, that we understand the nature of Jesus' priestly work. First, because, you know, His work assures you and I that His one-time death on the cross is enough to cover all of my sins, past, present, and future. That's good news. Can I, just, can I just point out to you, I mean, like, I, I hear people get really wrapped around the axle sometimes about this and, and wondering, like, what if, what if I don't have a chance to repent, you know, like if I, I sinned, you know, like the, I, I'm in a car accident, you know, and I like let out an expletive just before I hit the other car, you know, or whatever else, and I'm just like, you know, that's a complete misunderstanding 
You see, when he gave his life once for all, 2,000 years ago, he covered all the sin of the Old Testament people of God and all the sin of the New Testament people of God all at once. When he gave his life on the cross, when you received Jesus, he forgave your sin that day and all your sins going forward. I don't mean for us to ever take that lightly or to see it as a license to sin. But there is that sense in which his finished work, you and I have this assurance that it was enough. And that's really good news. The other part is the nature of his prophetic word was sufficient for us to to continue walking in light and life and not to continue sinning in ignorance, that you and I have from His words, we have light and life and that we have everything we need for life and godliness. That's actually what the Apostle Paul says. He says, well, you have everything that you need for life and godliness. You and I don't need some other additional revelation to keep us from sin. We don't, have, we don't need another revelation to explain to us uh, what it is that we have to do uh, in, in, in walking with Him. Now, I love prophetic words when they encourage people and give them some sense of direction about things that have nothing to do with that. But but can I just tell you that it's really fundamentally important that you and I know that there's not going to be some other revelation, there's not going to be some other uh, book out there that's going to change the direction of what you and I do. It's not like he's going to come back and say, you know what, I had a better idea. You know, for the last couple of millennia, I've been thinking about it and... I think I came up with a better idea this time. And so then his invitation to us, for those who know him, listen, his sacrifice, can, you know, his sacrifice to, for us not only made us whole and set us free, but it gives us eternal life now. Gives us eternal life now. That means that you don't have to wait for the sweet by and by to experience His power and His presence in your life. That you don't have to wait to go to heaven to have eternal life. He's offering that eternal life in the now, in the present, that you and I can walk in His power and His presence, that we can know His forgiveness today. Instead of doing this kind of finish line faith gospel where we just simply uh, uh, obey, pray a a, a prayer, uh, go get baptized, baptized or whatever else, and then, and then we just live powerless and without life. And so many people, can I just tell you, so many Christians I know live in that place of defeat, of constant spiritual defeat, no authority in their lives, no hope, no sense of, uh, of His internal presence, no hope, no sense of His being present in the now with you. And what a horrible way to live your life, constantly in expectation that someday it's going to get better, but right now it just sucks. And then we say, hey, but come join us at 9 o'clock in the morning. Isn't it why they're praying the prayer on TV just to get the little fire insurance and have no idea, have no idea, sadder still? There's probably some of us here today that are living in that same place. We might as well be watching it on television. We're just kind of consumers of the faith, watching from a distance, watching other people live and walk free and thinking it can't be mine or there's nothing that can change. And I want to tell you, that his invitation for you is to walk in his power and his presence now. He, he wants you to have eternal life today. He wants you to be able to decide to choose life in the now, in the present. And you can do that through the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit. You can enjoy eternal life now. I didn't say it was going to be perfect. See, we have this tension because his final return hasn't come. So we live in the now, but we also realize that there's the not yet. There is a time coming when it gets sweeter than this. But why would you want to live right now in something less than his presence and his power? Why would you want something less than eternal life right now? Is there really a better offer out there? I just, I don't know what it is. I'm not convinced. So his invitation is that you you might know him. 
See, his sacrifice can make you whole and it can set you free and it can give you eternal life. But here's the other thing. His word is sufficient for you to walk according to his ways. And if you stumbled or you need encouragement or prayer to continue to walk, listen, prayer team members are going to come on up. In fact, you know what, prayer team members, just come on up. Come on up. So let me invite you. Man, if you're struggling, if, if, if really if 2020 has got you 2020 you know, if you're like in that place where you think to yourself, man, I just, I feel defeated. I, I'm talking to so many people lately that are expressing that sense of defeat. And, and I understand it's exhausting. It's been a tiring year. I heard a few people say they're actually just going to stay up till midnight for New Year's, not because they want to celebrate, because they want to make sure that he leaves. I'm not sure that 2021 is going to be a better guest, but, you know, we'll pray. But there is power for living today. You don't have to live under the circumstances. You can get on top of them. I'm not saying that life is going to be easy. I'm not saying it's not going to be without difficulty, but you can do it without His power or you can do it with His power. I would suggest the latter. Secondly, if you're here this morning and this is, you know, you just, you've never experienced His power and His presence, maybe you've never known Him for yourself, I, I just want to invite you to come. I, I don't want to do like this prayer thing and then you just kind of sit there and, and maybe later a few weeks from now you get baptized or something like that or, or, or whatever. Can I, I, I tell you that I just think that we're just, it, it's too convenient for us sometimes to just let people sit in the dark. But my understanding of the word is that when you come to him, that, that it, it, it happens best in a relationship because that's what you're saying yes to. You're saying yes to a relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. And so I want to invite you, if, if you're thinking about his grace, his forgiveness, the hope of eternal life, that you would then come and talk to somebody up here or talk to the person next to you, uh, that, you that brought you, about what it means to have eternal life, what it means to do life with Jesus, and that you'd let them disciple you and teach you about what it's really like to walk the Christian life, not just to simply say a prayer and then keep going on living the way you've always lived. It'll be very disappointing. It'll be very disappointing. That's why you need discipleship. That's why you need relationship. And so I want to invite you to that. So let me invite you to come get some prayer and discover who he is and what he wants to do in your life. And then last thing, let you know, just as as you and I rush into this Christmas season, and I know it's a madhouse, you're out there buying gifts and your lists and you're checking them twice and all that kind of good stuff. And, you know, we scorn the fact that we say, well, Why is, you know, sometimes we have little bags or something. Jesus is the reason for the season. And it's really, it's 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 nice. It's a nice sentiment. So let me ask you, how that's true in your life? How? Besides a Jesus ornament on the Christmas tree, how is Christmas, this Christmas or any other, really about? Jesus, and that he came. I ask you that question for a reason. See, it's one thing for us to rail against the world about how they don't do things right. It's another thing for you and I to examine ourselves in the mirror and say, what evidence is there that I have stopped to think and to contemplate about who Messiah is and what his coming means to me. How does that translate into changing my life? And this Christmas, who's going to know? Who's going to know unless you open your mouth and you speak of the Christ of Christmas? So my challenge to you, and maybe you even want to get some prayer for that, is that you would make this Christmas more about Jesus than the presence under the tree or the family gathered around it. That's my invitation to you. 
We hope you enjoyed worshiping with us. If you would like more info about any of the ministry opportunities or to stay connected, please visit myvineyard.church. If you're watching us on YouTube, stay up to date with us by subscribing and hitting the notification bell. You can also connect to us through Facebook or Instagram. God bless and stay safe. We'll see you next week. Thank you.